Kids, come on up. Okay, adults, I'm going to put you on the spot. If you do not feel comfortable doing it, just say no thank you when I ask for you to stand. Okay? Kids, I have a question for you. Am I old or young? I'm old? Because look, because my hair is turning white, so that tells you that I'm old? No? What tells you that I'm old? Because I'm fat? No, no. Because I'm smart. Hmm, okay. Because I have wrinkles. That, that could be a reason for me to, be, to look like I'm older. Yes. Because I'm tall. Okay, Lillian, come over here, because you are the smallest of all the people that's on the front row. Come on up and stand next to me. This is Lillian. She is 75 years old. <laughs> She's not? How old are you, Lillian? She's five years old. So she's smaller than me, so she has not lived as long as I have. I, I have lived longer than Lillian, right? Okay, Adrian, you come on up. Just because they're shorter doesn't mean they're younger? Sometimes they don't like to sleep, and that makes... Adrian, how old are you? Seven. You're seven, Okay. You're 75. But let me see. Do you have any gray hairs? No, you can sit down. Do you know when I was 23 years old? Is 23 years old old? Not really. Did you know when I was 23 years old, I started getting gray hair? See, you can start getting gray hair as young as 20 or 23. Um, Mr. Cole, would you stand up? Is he old or is he young? He's old? <laughs> See, it's all... He's just a, a medium. He's a medium. How old are you, Cole? Are you willing to share? He's 36. I'm 64. So he is, he's ha almost halfway, a little bit more than halfway between death and me. I'm <laughs> <laughs> birth and me. <laughs> I'm halfway between him and death. That's what it is. Anybody else that wants to share? Um... Susan, are you willing to stand up? Yeah. Is Susan old or young? Old. She's old? You don't ever tell ladies they're old. <laughs> okay, how, old do you how old do you think she is? 70. She's not 70. How old are you, Susan? She's 63. Thank you, Susan. We have one other person standing who's right behind you guys. How old do you think she is? 91? 100? Rhoda, how old are you? She's an almost 94 years old. Yay! Now, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. In the Bible, in the Bible, remember last week I told you guys about the Ten Commandments? You remember that? And remember I said lying was not a good one. And remember I said some other ones. But did you know in the Ten Commandments, there is a promise that you will live a long time. Did you know that? Let me read it to you. It says, Honor your father and your mother, and your days will be long. The Lord will give them to you. Honor your father and mother so that your days may be long that, that the Lord, I mean, in the land that the Lord is giving to you. The, the Lord will grant you long life if you honor your father and mother. Isn't that cool? So that means I must have honored my father and mother. Because one of the things you need to understand is even when you're not a little kid anymore, even when you're an adult, you still have to honor your father and mother. Cole, is that true? 
You still, even though he's an adult and has kids of his own, he still has to honor his father and his mother. I still have to honor them. I still have to. Now, there's one other, there's one other, one other thing I want you to hear. This is something that Jesus said to his disciples. He said, he was talking about keeping his commandments, not just honoring father and mother, because that's the one that gives us promise of a long life. But Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep all of my commandments. That means anything that the Bible tells us to do, we have to do it if we truly love Jesus. And if you don't obey the commandments, that you won't have eternal life. That's right. And you won't. You're actually showing that you don't really love Jesus. That could happen. If a person does not have right relationship with God, if they don't have a right, if they don't love God and love Jesus, they could, they could go down to the, to, the, to the dark place and be separated from God forever. That's somehow, that's how our brains kind of imagine it. There's a, cl- there's a, a cloud down there that's red? Okay. I, we can talk more about that in the future when you're a little bit older. Yes, Mr. Adrian. Really? Wow, cool. That's Minecraft stuff. Well, listen, I want to pray with <laughs> We're getting off the track here. I want to pray with you guys. I want to pray with you guys. Jesus, I ask that you would help these kids to live long lives. And the way that they're going to do that is that they're going to follow you. They're going to honor you. Just like they have to honor their mother and father, they have to honor you and obey all of your commandments, and you will bless them. And Father, I pray that you grant them a life that is long and healthy and happy and full of joy and peace because they have based their whole life on love for you. Be with them, Father. Bless them, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can go back to your class now. Uh, No, 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 no. Thank you. Thank you for being willing, old people. Um, In order to help you to understand what's going on, I need to give you a visual aid. So Craig, would you bring up that map that I gave you this morning? Now, you see how easy that map is to read? That's why... Evelyn and Elsie are going to pass out to you guys these printed maps because otherwise you would never (laughs) be able to follow what I'm going to talk about. So while they're passing those maps out, if you could turn to 1 Samuel chapter 22. 1 Samuel, chapter 22. Now, to catch us up, because we don't have time this morning to go through five or six uh, chapters. 1 Samuel, chapter 22. If you remember, David is running away from Saul. Saul is trying to kill him. Saul sent people to his home to try and kill him. Saul sent people to Ramah, where Samuel was living, to try and kill David. Saul, I mean, Samuel talked, David talked with his friend Jonathan, and Jonathan found out that indeed Saul was trying to kill David, and so Jonathan sent David away using that arrows story. And then David, in chapter 21, goes to a place called Nob. And quite honestly, I didn't look to see if Nob was listed on. It is. See the number four? Okay, number four. Look under, immediately under the number four, you see the name Jebus or Jebus. That's Jerusalem. Okay? 
That's where the Jebusites lived. Just above Nob is Gibeah. That's the, land, the town where Saul main, had his headquarters. So David was living in Gibeah. David went home. His wife told him, climb out the back window and I'll hide a statue in bed to make people think you're asleep. And that gave David time to get away and he got as far as Nob. He got to Nob in chapter 21 where he approaches the, the, the priest, Ahimelech, and he says to Ahimelech, I am on a mission from the king and I need, and we talked about that. He lied to him. And he got the sword of Goliath and he got the holy bread and then he left. But while he was there, there was someone from the court of King Saul present at that at Nob. His name was Doeg. Doeg, what was his nationality? I don't have it in front of me. Um, Doeg, 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 Doeg. Edomite, thank you. He was an Edomite. If you look at your calendar, I mean, look at your calendar, look at your map, in the upper right-hand corner, you see Heshbon, and then underneath that, you see Dibon. That's uh, outside of Israel. Then you see Moab in that dark at the bottom corner by the Dead Sea, then what you can't see underneath Moab is Edom. Okay? So Doeg, the Edomite, is from the area outside of Israel, south of the Dead Sea, south of Moab. But he is serving in the king's court in Gibeah. He happens to be in Nob and sees David coming through. That's going to be important in just a few minutes. Then David flees to Ramah. That's above, just north of Gibeah. Do you see that? Okay, remember Nob and Gibeah are right near the number four on that map. Then Ramah is right near the number two on that map, just north of Gibeah. Okay, so when David ran away from Saul and he left by going out the window of his house, he ran to Ramah, which is where prophet Samuel was staying. And then Saul chased him there, and God overpowered everybody, and David was able to get away. So then David flees, in verse, 20, verse 10 of chapter 21, David flees to Gath. Look all the way to the left, at the top, on the top left. Do you see the word Philistia? That's where the Philistines live. That's where Goliath was from. And you see by the number 5 and the number 16, you see the village of Gath. That's where David ran to. In verses 10 through 15 of chapter 21, David is with the, in Gath with the Philistines and he has to pretend to be a mad and ma crazy man. It says he's scratching the walls and letting spit come down on his beard. And the king says, why did you bring this crazy man to me? Get him out of here. So David, now chapter 22, departs from there and escapes to the cave of Adullam. Or Adullam. I don't know how to pronounce it. So you go across from Gath, you see the number six. You see A-D-U-L-L-A-M. Does everyone see that? Now look at Adullam in reference to the area of Bethlehem. What is significant about Bethlehem in the story of David? That's his hometown. What was David in the family order? He was the eighth child, the youngest. What was his job? He took care of the sheep. What did that mean? He was in all the outlying areas around the village of Bethlehem taking care of the sheep. He had to move them every so often because they would eat the grass. So it is very likely that David as a child knew about this cave at Adullam because of his time roaming around with the sheep. So now when he is running for his life, David tries to go outside of Israel and gets 
finds he's in trouble, so he pretends to be crazy, and then he leaves there, and he goes to the cave at Adullam. Now let me read to you what one of the scholars that I was reading this week wrote about the cave at Adullam. There appears, therefore, no sufficient reason to disturb the tradition of 700 years which fixes the cave of Adullam about six miles southeast of Bethlehem. In the side of the wild gorge El Coritan, it has been visited by many travelers who all describe it as an immense natural cavern in the side of a cliff. It is very difficult to access the cave of Adullam. In the year 1861, Dr. J.P. Newman explored the cave and wrote this. Entering the cave through a passageway six feet high, four feet wide, and 30 feet long, but that passageway soon contracts to such dimensions that it compelled us to first stoop and then to creep we finally at length found ourselves in the hiding place of King David. Owing to a curve in this tunnel, no sunlight ever penetrates this dismal abode. Lighting our candles, now this is 1861, okay, so they didn't have electricity. Lighting our candles, we began to explore the cave. We found the interior divided into chambers, halls, galleries, and dungeons connected by intricate pathways, passageways. The chief hall is 120 feet long and 50 feet wide. The ceiling is high and arched, ornamented with pendants resembling stalactites. And from the walls extend sharp projections on which the ancient warriors apparently hung their arms. The effect was grand as our candles revealed each irregular arch, each graceful pendant, each sharp projection, giving the whole the appearance of a grand Gothic hall. Lateral passages radiate in every direction from this large chamber, but ultimately converge in a central room. The darkness and silence were oppressive, and the seclusion and intricacies of the cave would have baffled any attempt of, Saint, of Saul to capture the object of his pursuit. From the side of the first chamber, we reached a pit that was ten feet deep. And from that pit, we found a low, narrow alley that was 210 feet long, which led to another hall, which is known as the Inner Sanctum, where David held his secret councils. David probably became fam familiar with this cave in his childhood, where he kept his father's flocks near Bethlehem. His brethren and all of his father's house went down thither, because on account of Saul's rage, their lives were no longer safe at Bethlehem. You see, David left Israel, went to Gath, and he got blocked and had to come back to Israel, and he went to Adullam, because what happened was he needed to take care of his mom and dad and his brothers, who were now targets of King Saul. King Saul is, on a, is just lost his mind. He is trying to do anything he can to kill David. And if you read verse 2, or verse 1, excuse me, when his brothers, when David's brothers and all of his father's house heard that he was at the cave, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was in bitter soul gathered to David, and he became commander over them. And there were with him about 400 men. So, God has started to position David to be a leader in the nation of Israel. 
the king, King Saul, has completely lost it. David, who is anointed to be the next king, but is a, under threat of death right now, is having to hide and run for his life. But there are other people who are affected by this, this maniac on a rampage, and specifically David's family, and most specifically his mother and father. So they run to David because they hear he's at the cave. So he brings them into this cave where they will be safe. But he realizes even there they're not safe because all Saul has to do is light a fire at the entrance to the cave and they would never get out alive. So David realizes I have got to do something to take care of my mom and my dad. And so what does he do? Look at verse 3. David goes there from Mizpah of, uh, from there to Mizpah of Moab. So look at your, your maps again. Look at the left-hand side. See, I mean the right-hand side, see where it says Moab, just to the right of the Dead Sea. And you see the number seven. It says Kir Haraseth, parentheses, Mizpah of Moab. Scholars think that's probably where it was. So, you're at Cave Agilum, where the number six is, and he's got to get his mom and dad across, down under the Dead Sea, and over to Mitzvah of Moab. That was the safest place for his family. It was hard. Look at where Gibeah is, and, and where because that's where, where Saul's headquarters are. He would have to go around either end of the Dead Sea down into Moab to get to the family. So that was, that was a, a, a physical landmark. But why Moab? Why would David bring his mother and his father to Moab? Because of who? Because of Ruth, exactly. Turn to the book of Ruth, chapter 4, which is just before 1 Samuel. So if you just go back a few pages. It's Judges, Joshua, I mean Judges, excuse me, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel. So go to Ruth, chapter 4, verses 13 through 22. Ruth, chapter 4, verses 13 through 22. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went in to her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to her mother-in-law, Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a Redeemer. May his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer, excuse me, a, a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named this child Obed. He was the father of Jesse, who is the father of David. So Ruth, go down to verse 18. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron, Hezron fathered Ram, Ram fathered Amminadab, Amminadab fathered Nashon, Nashon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, Jesse followed David. Now go backwards. David's father was Jesse. David's grandfather was this child Obed. So why would David take Jesse back to Moab? Because his great-grandmother, his father's grandmother, was from Moab. They have family connections there. Takes them in and says, take care of them. Hide them. Don't let anything happen to them. And then he has to go back. Because he's got 400 people he's responsible for. See, he's honoring his father and mother even in his old age. He can't just worry about himself. God has positioned him to be a leader, and he has to be careful not just for himself, but for his family, for all of these other 400 people who have now gathered around him. And remember I said, Doeg the Edomite comes into the story in just a second? Well, here we are. Look back at your map. We're back at Gibeah, number three where Saul is um, Saul is, is on a rampage. So if you look at verse 
6 of chapter 22. Saul heard that David was discovered and the men were with him. So now Saul, no oh, I forgot. I forgot there was one last thing. After David takes his family down to Moab, there's a prophet that comes to David and says, don't go back to the cave. Go instead to the forest of Hereth. Now look at Adullam on your map, verse 6, I mean number 6. Go to the, le to the right, you'll see a number 9 with a question mark. And it says, forest of Hereth. See, God, through a prophet, is letting David know, don't go back to the cave, because Saul knows you're there. Go to this forest where you're easier, it's easy, going to be easier for you to hide and evade capture, because there is no, nothing blocking you from going in any direction when and if Saul's army comes after you. So God has already given David warning and said, change your location, go to the forest of Hereth. So now, <clears throat> excuse me, so now Saul, verse 6, Saul hears that David has been discovered, and the men who were with him, and Saul was sitting at Gibeah, under the tamarisk tree in the height with his spear in his hand, and all his servants were standing about him, and Saul said to his servants who stood about him, hear now, people of Benjamin, Will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards? Will he make you all commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds that you have conspired against me? No one discloses to me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. None of you is sorry for me or discloses to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as at this day. Then Doeg the Edomite answered who stood by the servants of Saul. I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob. He spoke to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, and he inquired of the Lord for him, and he gave him provisions, and he gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. So the king sent to summon Ahimelech, the priest, the son of Ahitub, and all his father's house. Now, one of the things we're not remembering, Ahimelech is the grandson of the high priest Eli. Eli's grandson, Ahimelech, is right now the high priest. So think about this. King Saul is calling the high priest to come before him and give him an accounting for his treason. And so Ahimelech comes. Where am I at? Da, 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 da. Saul said, Hear now, O son of Ahitub. And he answered, Here I am, Lord. And Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse, in that you had given him bread and a sword and have inquired of God for him, that he has risen against me to lie in wait as at this day? Then Ahimelech answered the king, And who, who among all your servants is so faithful as David? Who is the king's son-in-law and captain over your bodyguard and, and honored in your house? Is today the first time that I've inquired of God for him? No! Let not the king in, impugn any, I mean, impute anything to his servant or all the house of my father, for your servant has known nothing of all this, much or little. And the king said, You shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's house. And the king said to the guard who stood about him, Turn and kill the priests of the Lord, because their hand is also with David. And they knew that he fled and did not disclose it to me. But the servants of the king would not put out their hand to strike the priests of the Lord. Then the king said to Doeg, now stop. This is so casual in the way it's written. This is an incredibly tense moment. You've got the entire household of priests, Ahimelech and all of his sons. And you've got the king in his face, spitting, foaming. And then he turns to his guard and he says, kill them all. And the guard stands there going, uh, no, no, this ain't right. No, we can't do this. And Sam, uh, Saul's like, I'm your king! Kill them! And now finally he turns. I lost my place. Where was I? Verse 18. Then, Doeg, then the king said to Doeg, you turn and strike the priests 
And Doeg the Edomite turned and struck down the priests. And he killed on that day 85 persons who wore the linen ephod. Every single priest. And Nob, the city of priests. So he left where he was, Gibeah, and went down to Nob. And he put to the sword every man, every woman, every child, every infant, every ox, every donkey, every sheep. He put them all to the sword. But one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, came, his name was Abiathar. He escaped and he fled and went to David. And Abiathar, when he got to David, told him that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. And, Abi and David said to Abiathar, I knew on that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul. I have occasioned the death of all the persons of your father's house. Stay with me. Do not be afraid. For he who seeks my life seeks your life. With me you shall be in safe keeping. Now, this is a horrible story. This is a horrible story. But look at what God has done. God has taken David and put him into a position of authority. God has rallied around David 400 people who are now his followers, who become his army. God has taken the only surviving member of the high priest's house who comes to David and is now the priest serving David. And one of the, co one of the uh, commentators I read said, Ahitab brought the high priest's outfit with him when he escaped. So he's now the high priest. And he's advising and ministering to and divining for King David, who's not yet king. But God has literally shifted everything to David at this point. It's powerful what's going on. It's horrible what's going on. And look at what's on David. This is the whole point of what I wanted to get to from looking at this whole big picture. Look what's on David. Imagine the depth of pain that he's going through. Imagine the grief that he's experiencing. My mom and my dad, they have had to leave their home. They have lost everything. I had to bring them to Moab. Do you realize, and I didn't want to bring this out, but I think I need to, in the Bible, this is the last we ever hear of David's family. And Jewish tradition has it that after David left Moab and returned to the land of Judah, the king of Moab assassinated David's family. Now, we have no biblical evidence of this. We have no historical evidence. It's simply anecdotal evidence. But it's believable. David has disrupted his family. David has lost everything. And now, David himself claims responsibility for the death of the entire high priest's household. And he says to him, to, uh, to uh, Ahimelech, uh, to, I'm sorry, what was his name? I don't have it in front of me. Thank you. Abiathar, Abiathar, he says to him, you stay with me. I, I, I will take care of you. I will protect you. But imagine what's going on in his head. It's hard because we don't have anything that we could no look to to know what's in his head. Ha, 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 ha. But we do. David is a poet. David, when he has his quiet time with God, writes songs. They have been recorded for us. Turn to the first one we're going to look at this morning, Psalm 52. Excuse me, Psalm, uh, yeah, Psalm 52. Psalm 52. Look at the intro to Psalm 52. To the choir master, a masculine of David, when Doeg the Edomite came and told Saul, David has come to the house of Ahimelech. This psalm was written 
when David learned from Abiathar that David was the cause of the death of the high priest's family. This is what he wrote. This is out of the depths of his soul. Why do you boast of evil, O mighty man? The steadfast love of God endures all the day. Your tongue plots destruction like a sharp razor, you worker of deceit. You love evil more than good and lying more than speaking what is right. You love all words that devour, O deceitful tongue. But God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous shall see and fear and shall laugh at him, saying, See the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his own destruction? But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I will thank you forever because you have done it. I will wait for your name, for it is good in the presence of the godly. Whew. Here, a man has just had to totally uproot his family and move them to safety. Here, a man has uh, been responsible for the death of the entire high priest household because of what he did. Remember, he lied. Remember? Imagine the grief, the depth, but the anger, the rage he must feel towards Doeg. Because he said, I knew when I saw him. I knew when I saw him he was going give, to give everything away. And he doesn't hide his anger and his frustration. He uses very strong words in this psalm. But there's a turning in verse 8. And he said, I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I will wait for your name, for it is good. I will wait in the presence of the godly. He could have said, we're going all 401 of us to go kill Doeg and his family. And his army would have followed him. But he had to settle in his heart. This is not my fight. This is the Lord's battle. I have to trust God. I cannot do this on my own. This is something only God can do for me. I can't fix this. I can't. I have nothing that would make this right. But God can do it. That's the first psalm. Look at Psalm 57. Here's the intro to Psalm 57. This is David's note or somebody's note. To the choir master, according to Do Not Destroy, a miktam of David when he fled from Saul in the cave. So here he is in the cave. This is before he knows about the death of the high priest's family. This is when he's just left the Philistines and he's now in the cave hiding from Saul and these 400 people are gathering around him. Be merciful to me, O oh God. Be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God Most High, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. My soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amidst fiery beasts, the children of man whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They set a net for my steps. My soul was bowed down. They dug a pit in my way, but they had fallen into it themselves. My heart, 
My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake, my glory. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Have you ever gotten yourself into a situation where you were feeling overwhelmed? Have you ever gotten to the point where you recognized that it was your fault? You said or did something that caused all the problem, and as a result, other people got hurt? Have you ever gotten to yourself to a point where there is absolutely nothing you can do to fix it or to make it right or to bring restoration? No matter how hard you try, no matter how many times you go and say, I'm sorry, it's never going to be fixed. It can never be put back the way it was. You are in exactly the same place that David was. You are exactly in the same spot. Different circumstances, different names, probably different emotions. But the reality is, no matter who's against you, God is for you. No matter how badly you've messed up, God still loves you. No matter what horrible things happened as a result of your poor choices and your poor actions and your poor words, God can still bring glory to his name. The steadfast love of God can bring about good out of the bad. And as we said at the beginning, he is exceedingly, he can do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we could ever ask or imagine. So it's not just simply saying, God, make it right. It's saying, God, I rest in you. I trust you. And whatever you choose, God, I know, <laughs> I know it can be good again. Let your glory be exalted over all the earth. That's all I care about at this point. God, you are my refuge. You are my stronghold. You will protect me. You will guide me. You will comfort me. You will take care of me. You are the source. You are my shield. You are everything to me, oh God. And I have to release this all to you because I can't make it right. So I trust you. And I'm not even going to try to dictate to you what you should do. I'm going to let you be the one to make those decisions. I'm going to sit here and honor you and bring glory to your name. That's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to try and do it for myself anymore. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to honor you. And that's all I'm going to do. Now, in your normal self, you're going to leave the church service after going, oh, that was such a good sermon. <sighs> Thank you, God. Oh, that blessed me. I got tears in my eyes. Woo! I feel so warm. And you're going to go home and pick it right back up again. And you don't need to do that. You need to leave it. If you left it here, then leave it here. Don't go back and try to fix it. When the enemy tries to get you to pick it back up, you say, oh, no, 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 no. I gave it to God. It's in, it's in his hands. You go talk to him about it. That's your answer when the enemy tries to get you to pick it back up again after this, this morning. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We honor you. We give you glory. Our hearts desire is to just love you. And Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will follow my commandments. So help us, God, to do just that, to love you the best way we know how, 
by following your commandments. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.